All righty, this afternoon we're going to be going on part two uh, from last week. Uh, last week we went over the way. Um, a little bit of a review of last week. Um, we went over the narrow and the wide road. We explained uh, that the narrow road is kind of like, the narrow road was kind of like, um, like a back road. Um, the wide road was kind of like the interstate. Um, we explained the different types of demons that people address, uh, drugs, the drink, the lust, the depression, uh, and the anger. Um, and then we explained how the demons control your actions. Uh, we explained how demons start, how they get started. Uh, the results of losing your demons uh, following Christ. Um, and we asked, what, would, what did you do with your demons, ultimately? Do you give it to God or don't you? We use John 3, 16 through 20 as a reference. Let's turn there real quick, just a moment. John 3, 16 through 20. John 3, 16 through 20, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is why how the demons came into effect. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. This week we're going to hit on John chapter 14 verses 5 through 6. John 14, 5 and 6. John 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So today we're going to hit truth. The title of this message is What Hinders Truth? The first is the, your title uh, or your position, if you will, and that helps change or mold your behavior. Let's go to John 18, 33 through 38. John 18, 33 through 38. In verse 33... It says, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Sayest thou saying things, let's see, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did another tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, I am a Jew, or Pilate, I can't read tonight. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Then Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Now, most of the people that do truth, they use this verse. What is truth? Pilate does that. Everybody that I've ever that looked up for commentary, everybody uses this. P 
Pilate doesn't care about the truth. His main goal in asking all of these reasons for him being a king is if Jesus is going to use his authority to buck the Roman kingdom. So he wanted to make sure, what is your attention? In verse 35, what hast thou done? Jesus reassures him that my kingdom is not of this world. So he's telling Pontius Pilate to like, it's, I'm not going to do anything to avert your power. You're fine. Let's go to John 19, 5 through 12. John 19, 5 through 12. Should be just right over a little bit. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto him, Behold the man. When the chief priest there for an officer, officer saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he had himself, he made himself, or he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou that I not I, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. In this passage we find out that he indeed understands fully what the actual case was against Jesus. They said that he is the Son of God. And we read that Pilate was afraid of that. And he questioned him the more, and he said that you would have no power over me unless it would be given to you from above. Let's go to Luke chapter 23, verses 20 through 23. So Luke 23, 20 through 23. Luke 23. 20 through 23. Pilate therefore willing to release Jesus spake again to him, but they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with the loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And this is the key to this verse. And the voices of them, of the chief priest, prevailed I did some research in 1789 George Washington was the first person that took oath putting his hand on the Bible every president but three John Quincy Adams Theodore Roosevelt and Lyndon B. Johnson those are the only three people that did not get sworn in with their hand on the Bible most of the time, when people with power, as you saw Pilate, most of the time their choice is they don't want to lose power. Most of the time, like when the people rose their voices up and they raised it up, the more it prevailed. The people and the choices that they make prevailed. Most of the time, other interferences like people, they can come in and make their decisions for them. There has to be some form of a standard for a governing body. Our founding fathers set up the House, the Senate, the Constitution as a way of balancing power. 
However, as they swore into office, what they were pleading to was to uphold not only the law of the land, but they would do it in a righteous way. That they would uphold what the law, you know, in God we trust, was what they held above everything else. Regardless of Republican or Democrat or where you stood, the Bible itself, the president, the lead person, the Bible was supposed to be their sworn-in oath that they would uphold. Pilate only concern when it came to Jesus is that he didn't want to have rebellion against Rome. That was his only goal. He was told the truth and he dismissed the truth and he found no fault in him, but he was moved by the people. I wonder how many people in power are moved by people. Not by what they swore in, not because of their conviction, not because of anything, but because of people and how they can control them and manipulate them. How many people in power don't hold to the truth? In Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. Daniel 2, verse 21. Daniel 2, verse 21. Daniel 2, verse 21. And he changed the times and the seasons. This is the key right here. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. God himself sets up power. And I think that people forget that. I think that people think that they gain power of their own accord or that they made right. God himself sets up kings and takes kings down. Well, here for a while it was like 70 degrees and then it was like 20. God controls the weather as well. But the truth can be hidden and stashed away because of power. Let's go to Luke Chapter 4, verse 18. Luke 4, verse 18. Luke 4, 18. This is what Jesus read at his hometown. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set, he has sent me to the heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty to them are bruised. And then verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the, of the Lord. That was his mission statement. And at the latter part of verse 21, it says, this day in the scriptures is fulfilled in your ears. In your ears. However, many people did not believe that he was the Messiah. In John 1.29, if you wouldn't mind turning there for me, John 1.29, John 1.29, the next day John seeth, Jews, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of of the world. Number one was the power and how it inf influences truth. The number two is trials and tribu tribulations cause doubt of the truth. In John 129, we can clearly see that John the Baptist knows who Jesus is. However, we go to Matthew chapter 11. Let's go to Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, verse 2 through 5. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, 
Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. Verse 5. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are healed, and the dead and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Verse 2. When it says that he heard, he was in prison. I don't know if anybody's ever went through trials. He proclaimed Jesus openly, but when he got in trouble, he was so quick to question, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? In verse 4, go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. I think Jesus understood that John heard, but he wanted to reinforce him with, I guess, eyewitness accounts. In Matthew 11, 7 and 10, Matthew 11, 7, it says, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? And then verse 11, or actually, sorry, verse 10, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. When people heard verse 10, you don't have to turn there, but Malachi 3.1 is what he was referring to. He was telling people that John was the one that was the messenger for the Messiah. As he was denying him. When somebody is flat out saying that you're not the Messiah... And Jesus swallowed his pride and said, you know what? I'm going to give John the due diligence that he deserves. I'm going to say he is the messenger, which puts John to the people that knew Malachi 3.1, that they would see that John was indeed foretold in the Old Testament. In verse 4, 11.4, it gives two things that we need to have to believe truth. Things which you do hear and see. Most of the time, you can hear things. But most of the time, we need to see things. Most of the time that you can hear, it depends on the source. You can hear things, but it's easier if you actually lay your eyes on it. However, Scripture says that faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17. What about turning there? Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. It says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Truth itself needs substance and evidence. That is found in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I wrote down the Hebrew word for this, but I didn't write because I couldn't pronounce it. Um, so I just put... That substance in Greek means assurance. So if you want to substitute substance with assurance, it's the same thing. Evidence in this, in this verse here is a sense of proof that results in conviction. So, faith is the assurance. And then it says of things hoped for. Things hoped for is a future hope. 
not a present hope, of things hoped for for the future. And then the evidence, of course, is the conviction, and it says of things not seen. That's the present reality that are unseen. The hope that we as Christians have is of the resurrection, the return of Christ, the glorification of the saints. Those are the things that we hope for for the future. The present of unseen is the forgiveness of sins through Christ's sacrifice and the present intercession that Christ has in heaven. So if we put all of that together, I think it gives the best definition of faith that there is. It says, now faith is the assurance of the resurrection, the return of Christ, and the glorification of the saints. Faith is the present conviction of the forgiveness of sins through Christ's sacrifice and his present intercession of Christ in heaven. That brings us to point number three. Religion can blind you. Religion can blind you. I can't talk today for some odd reason. We have the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I think when we read the Bible, we expect people that we read in Genesis to know the New Testament. But we have to look at it from the standpoint of what they had. What did they have at their fingertips? Their truth, their Bible in a sense, was the Old Testament. That's what they had. What they... Sometimes even what they hear from people, what was passed down to them through generation to generation. What was their truth? Looking at the assurance of things hoped for, what was Abraham's assurance? If you look back at the Old Testament. Let's go to Genesis 12, 1 through 3. We covered that this morning in Sunday school, which that was the... The funny part. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This is Abram's call. This is he's not called Abraham yet, but this is Abraham's call. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. And from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In this, we see the I will mentioned four times. In Genesis 17, 19, let's just move over a couple pages. Genesis 17, 19. And God said, Sarah, which is his wife, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now, Abraham's ultimate seed is Jesus. Now, we don't have to go through the whole genealogy, but let's just go to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. It's the very first verse. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. However... He had to go by faith. He didn't know that everything was going to transgress between Genesis to Matthew. Let's go to Genesis 22.12. Genesis 22.12. Sorry, sorry. 22.2. 22.2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Mara, or Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering and upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Let's 
This was supposed to be the covenant that God placed to Abraham. Is God a man of his word? Genesis 22, 5 and 8. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Abraham was the highest form of faith that any Jew had. Genesis 15, 6. Let's just go back to that just briefly. Genesis 15, 6. It says, And he believed in the Lord and counted it to him for righteousness. The Torah, which is the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The entire Jewish Bible is the Torah. The New Testament is not part of the Jewish Scripture. But for the sake of the sermon, let's go to John chapter 8. Let's go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And this is verse 19. John, John chapter 8 verse 19. John 8 19. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, you should have known my father also. Verse 23. And he said unto him, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So this you can clearly see that, that Jesus is saying that God was his father. In verse 24. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins for if, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Verse 28. Then Jesus said unto them when ye have lifted up the Son of Man then shall you know that I am he and I do nothing of myself but as my Father hath taught me I speak these things. Verse 30. And he spake these words, and many believed on him. Verses 39 and 40. Let's go to 39. They answered him and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me and a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God this did not Abraham. Now to the Jew you have to think of it in their perspective. All they know is Abraham and the prophets. That's all that they know. Jesus comes along and says that my father is God if you don't believe that, you'll die in your sins. Many Jews believed him. Then he says, 39 and 40, it says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And then he says in the later part of verse 40, it says, this did not Abraham. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was counted unto him for righteousness. They went away from the exact teachings that Abraham taught them is believe God no matter what. Put your full trust in him and God's just calling them on it. He just said, 
If you were like Abraham, you would believe me. This hit the Jews hard when they said that you're not like Abraham. In verse 53, it says, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom, you, whom makest thou thyself? Or, you know, who do you think you are? See, Jesus was not only addressing truth to them, but was putting them on the spot and saying, everything that you know is going to change. Everything. Every, your belief system, everything that you've brought up with, everything that you know is about to change. You either go along with the change or die. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. If we go back, actually let's hit on Hebrews chapter 11 real quick. Let's just go to the Hall of Fame real quick. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Counting that God was able to rise, raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And the figure is just... A figurative sense. Now, imagine for a moment that Abraham tied up his son. He lays him down and he's just waiting for God to just do something. But if not, he was willing to kill his son. Then imagine a ram caught in the thicket. When he looked up, he saw that. Briefly, for a moment, now the Jew wouldn't see this because the Jew doesn't see it as a precursor to crucifixion because they don't believe that Jesus was anything. But Abraham stood there and he saw only begotten son there to be crucified. The lamb, he didn't get the lamb. The lamb was provided and he could see what was going to happen to his seed. But the Jews saw it as this oh, amazing thing of faith that Abraham did. They didn't see anything more, anything less. They just saw it as, well, they saved, God saved his son and he killed the ram and he came back down off the hill. They, they don't see anything else because they're blinded to it. 2 Corinthians 4.4 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It doesn't say that it has to necessarily be somebody that doesn't go to church doesn't have to be a person that is really religious. It is just saying, it blinded the minds of them which believe not. These people, in their day, was the righteous people that could be. They were in the synagogues, they did the sacrifices. To be at the level that they were meant that you had everything. But they were blinded by their own religion. John 1 17. John 1 17. John 1 
says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I guess one of the saddest verses in Scripture is, verse, is John 1.11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Being rejected by the very person that you came to save. John 8.57. John 8.57. This is their response to them when they've talked earlier about Abraham rejoiced to see the day. It said, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Verse 58, And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, another thing that for the Jews... They don't believe in the Trinity. They read what is called a Shema. That's the basis of Jewish belief. The verses, if you want to write them down, it's uh, they what they quote every year is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21, and Numbers 15, 37 through 41. What they hold pretty tight is Deuteronomy 6.4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In Jewish law, worship of a three-part God is considered idolatry. One of the three cardinal sins that a Jew should rather give up his life than transgress. Now, Jesus being a Jew understood that. Matthew 22 Verses 36 through 40. Matthew 22. Go to Matthew 22. 36 through 40. It says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto, the, like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus, being a Jew, understood what they thought, what they held to the highest degree, and that was loving God and being true to people. And it says, on these two commandments hold the law of the prophets. The second cardinal sin, there's three, but the second cardinal sin that they cannot do is murder. This is why that they brought Jesus Christ before Pilate. A Roman governor could pronounce death sentence to somebody. In Luke 23, 1 and 2. Let's go to Luke 23, 1 and 2. This is right after, if you go to verse, uh, chapter Luke 22, the last verses of that, you'll see that he claims to be the Son of God. But if you go to 23, 1 and 2, and the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We find this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is... Christ a king. They wanted to get him for political crimes. That's what set up the first part, or the first few verses that went over earlier. They were asking Jesus because that's what they were told him. They was told that, hey, this Jesus guy, he's not paying taxes and he's coming after your job. So Pilate was like, well, yeah, bring him in. If they would have came to him and said, first off, that he claimed to be God, that's, that's not worthy of death. And you actually see it later that he said that he's not worthy of death because to him, that's not really being rebellious against Rome. That's 
That's just your matter. That's your business. That's your problem. So, the Jews, I mean, one of the arguments is that the Jews killed him. The Jews didn't, but manipulated it pretty good and moved the Roman person. They knew that it's easy to manipulate somebody that is not hard to the truth. Especially if they can get over on you on something, if they can be moved by the crowd. And I think that that's going back to the first beginning. If you have the Bible as a standard, it takes care of itself. The person in rule, that's their guide. That's their book. That's what they go by. But if you are just a fleshly leader, you can be moved by a crowd very easily. You can be manipulated, you can be bought, you can be moved. And Jews understood that. All right, the number four is the perception that can blind you. We're going to not go over as many verses as I had previously, but let's just touch on a couple of them. John chapter four, it's a Samaritan woman. John chapter four. Go to five through nine. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water, Jesus said unto her, Give me drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask to drink of me, which am I a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now the Samaritans, they married the Gentile people. They mingled in, you know, intermarriage with them. And the Jews really didn't like that at all. In Matthew 10, 5 through 6, let's just hit this real quick. Matthew 10, 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 10, 5 through 6. These twelve Jesus set forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city of the Samaritans, even... Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Israel needed to repent first. Let's go to Acts 1 8. Acts 1 8. Acts 1 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Christ specified to his disciples not to go to Samaria at first, but then later said to go to Samaria. And I think, like Paul, Christ wanted to reach people, wanted to reach like-minded people, and wanted to reach people, the Jews first. A lot of things get in the way of truth, which we covered already, but title, persecution, and religion. Those were the three main attributes, and mostly the Jewish people uh, held all three. Let's go to John chapter 10, or John chapter 4, verse 10. John chapter 4, verse 10. John 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said, If thou knowest the gift of God whom it is that saith unto thee, Give me the drink, and thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee 
living water. Now for the sake of time, we're going to go down through and hit verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing unto the everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, and, and said I have no husband, Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast five husbands, and the one whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. If you read verse 18 properly, it says, Thou now hast, and let's read 18 all over again, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. Jesus is pretty much saying that if it's not your husband, it's somebody else's husband that's with you. So he knew that she was not only been married all these times, but currently in adultery. And he's still talking to her as a Jew, still trying to reach her, still trying to help her out. Sometimes our perception blinds us. Oftentimes we look at somebody and we see they can't be saved. Or maybe they're just too far out there or their circumstances. I think that our perceptions sometimes are mingled a little bit because we were just as bad as they were, if not worse. And I think sometimes our perception stops us. Even to the Jewish they saw Samaritans as a whole, not just individual people, but as a whole, bad people. And to this Jewish person that's even caught into adultery, most of the time they would just stone her, even Samaritan or not. But Jesus is willing to work with her. And then if you go down a little bit, verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Verse 21, Jesus said unto her, Woman, believest me, and the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what ye know, what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He is saying, ultimately, if you read this and you bring it through, I had to read it twice. He is saying that prayer will be opened up and salvation will be opened up to everyone. That's a hidden jewel that he told this Samaritan woman. He is saying, we'll be able to worship Everywhere, even you, a Samaritan person. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, verse 25, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto you, thee am he. So I am pretty much the Messiah. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the man come see a man which told me all the things that ever I did is not is not this the Christ then they went out of the city and came unto him in verse 41 and many more believed because of his word and said unto the woman now we believe not because of thy saying for we have heard him ourselves and know that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Most of the time, the truth is, 
Actually, let's hit this and then I'll hit on that point. 1 John 4, 1-6. 1 John 4, 1-6. This is the last verse. Last verses. 1 John 4, 1-6. All right, and this is, I put down in the five, is how to test the truth. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false process, prophets are gone out unto the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in flesh is not of God. And, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever ye have heard that it should come, and even now is already is in this world. So he's saying, if you believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and you believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the truth is in you. And if you do not believe that, the truth is not in you. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak ye of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that is not of God heareth not us, whereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So it doesn't say that you need to have this higher position and have all this knowledge, but the simple fact is, do you see Christ as the Messiah? Do you see him as the Son of God? That is ultimately the truth that we're speaking of tonight. Do you know the truth? Have you accepted Christ as the Son of God? Do you see him as being in the flesh or not? Don't let... Anything blind you. Don't let your religion blind you. Don't let persecution blind you. Just simply have the faith and understand that without knowing that, knowing Jesus Christ and what he came for, uh, it says that you'll die in your sins. All right, let's bow. Thank you, Lord, for this day.